Well, welcome to day five. I'd like today to state our theme, which is spiritual laws. And uh, this, this, the spiritual law that I have derived uh, from uh, Sir John's book, uh, in his own words, is, when we choose to allow our lives to be governed by spiritual principles, we may be sure that spirit will sustain us. So this is a uh, helpful and useful claim. Spiritual, we're familiar with the concept of law, scientific laws, scientific generalizations, statistical laws, laws, um, of course, that govern us, govern our society, the law. A little bit more uh, abstractly, we might think of uh, the laws of nature. We might think of laws that govern grammar, uh, laws that govern social interaction, where they don't seem to have the force of law or to be written into the, the, into the fabric of things. But for, for Sir John and for the world's religious traditions, there are laws, if you will, or spiritual principles, to use a, a less uh, threatening term, perhaps, are actually written into the fabric of being. In fact, apart from such organizing principles, there would not be a fabric of being. I mean, even in something as simple as a cloth, a woven cloth, there are regular patterns, and to jumble that pattern too much would be to make a cloth that was incapable of performing its basic functions. And so, if, if our reality is like a cloth, uh, and it's woven together from different materials, then there clearly is a pattern, and a pattern is nothing else than an expression of some underlying principle or law. And this is, this is what Sir, uh, Sir John means by a, a, a spiritual law or a principle. Um, and there are 200 in this book, and I've been expressing uh, only 18 of them. Uh, and if and this is a very traditional perspective, by the way. I, I do have to say that as a person of tradition, uh, and I would see myself to some degree as a person of tradition as well, tradition is our age-old human customs, not all of which are beneficial, but many of which are time-tested principles that can help us live more fruitful lives. And it's these kind of uh, laws or spiritual principles that we're talking about in this course. Um, and uh, what I would say uh, in trying to state one of the learning objectives for today, Sir John's understanding of spiritual laws, is that it might be helpful to, to use a different term. And for many of us, uh, outside of the traditional culture of India, or outside of the Buddhist tradition, uh, this word uh, may be relatively new if we've not heard it before. It's the, it's the word dharma. Dharma is a Sanskrit word that could be translated as spiritual law. And the word dharma, which is uh, used in all of the traditional in religions of India, dharma goes back to an old Sanskrit root. That means that which sustains everything, that which holds things together, their organizing principle, if you will. And so spiritual laws can be understood as dharma. How can we define dharma? And uh, this would be learn the, the next learning objective. Um, how, where, where do they come from? How do they differ from physical, social, legal, and other kinds of laws? Well. They, they, they differ in that they're, they're not encoded in a law book somewhere, uh, and they, we, we come by them often uh, through our upbringing. We encounter them in the, in the training or teaching that we receive from our elders uh, in our schooling or in, if we have a religious community, in our religious community. And these are principles that, if we put them to the test, we discover that they're true regardless of whether we agree with them or not. And it doesn't matter how we learn them either. We, could have, we, can have, we may have learned them from parents. We may have learned them in the rough-and-tumble school of life. But dharma is something that's simply not—it can't be violated. It's violated only at the cost of some kind of penalty. So, for instance, if we, if we don't take care of our bodies through proper diet and through exercise, there's only a certain amount of, of misuse that our bodies can endure before we start getting various ailments. That's dharma. 
there's there there's nothing it wasn't set up by a cosmic legislator and yet it is coercive it's coercive in this only in the sense that if you don't up, up, if you don't live by that dharma then there are some natural consequences that arise from it and then it's not a consequence that comes because of the anger of a divinity or a deity it's just if you're driving down the road and we have traffic laws, they're completely arbitrary traffic laws. Why should the lights be red instead of purple? Why should we have green and red lights and not, uh, I don't know, um, uh, purple and, and orange lights? This is a convention. And yet, if you decide to drive only when lights are red and to move and to stay still only when lights are green, you will very quickly obviously learn that the Dharma in those circumstances has lots of consequences, will have consequences, not good consequences. And so Dharma is like that. These are principles that are simply true because they constitute the very organizing um, structure of the life that we live. So I like this word Dharma. It's just to have a fresh word so that we don't always just say sp laws, because law can often have a negative uh, implication for many people when it comes to their personal lives. Now, a characteristic of, of dharma or spiritual laws is that they are true regardless. I mean, when you think about it, um, if you were to think about something like, uh, like something as simple as, a, as, as, a, as, as arithmetic or some simple logical uh, formulas, they remain true whether or in, in any universe. Even if there's no universe, the idea of, of addition remains the case. Two plus two equals four in any universe you can think about it. Express it differently, come up with a sophisticated arithmetic in which you can divide that out differently, and yet at some point we come back to the place that if you think that by adding three to two you're going to have four, that can result in serious errors. That's all a dharma really is. Now the thing about dharma is that so powerful are they that if they do exist, then even the gods, even the divinities, even the supreme beings of the world's religions cannot ultimately violate dharma. In some real sense, spiritual laws or dharma are prior even to the divinities or the deities. Now, some people may have such an exalted sense of their deity that they might find that to be offensive to the honor of the deity. But the fact is, is that any deity or divinity who did not uh, submit to cosmic law would be actually, could actually not, could be, would be out of line, to use a language that maybe people can accept. This was stated a long time ago by Socrates in one of his great ironic uh, dialogues, discussions that he had with an unwitting theologian by the name of Euthyphro. That I, that we, that, and this, if you were an undergraduate, if, if you took a philosophy course as an undergraduate, you may have encountered Socrates with the hapless uh, uh, theologian Euthyphro. And, and Socrates asks him, what is holy? What's pious? What's, what's, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is the holy? What is it that makes for holiness? Um, and Euthyphro uh, uh, eagerly responds as a noted theologian of his day, well, I should say that what all the gods love is holy. And on the other hand, what all the gods hate is unholy. But Socrates, of course, we remember him today in his dialogues, not because he agreed with the esteemed theologian, but because of the question he asked. He said then, is that which is holy loved by the gods because it is holy? Or is it holy because it is loved by the gods? And now that's, of course, a bit of a, a mind twister, and you can imagine undergraduate philosophy majors sitting around debating that one till four or five in the morning, perhaps. But there is a serious issue here, and that's why we still remember Socrates today, because he's, he's actually asking, he might even be stating, he never really stated things directly, that what makes something holy or sacred um, is, is the fact that it's holy in itself, and thus even the gods love it. It's not the case that something is holy or to be highly regarded because the gods say it is. I mean, that would be like a situation if, if a celebrity said to you, oh, if a celebrity were to tattoo him, her, uh, oneself 
uh, with something on on the on the forehead the next day uh, maybe a million people might have the same tattoo but what of what value is that it's only good because the celebrity said it's good but does it really make sense to tattoo your forehead and in a way Socrates would say no it doesn't make sense to tattoo your forehead just because someone else did it you don't have to do it so it's the same thing it's the same kind of question here what is what are these spiritual laws the spiritual laws are true regardless of whether we recognize them or not or whether or not any particular religion honors these laws so again this is a perspective that can allow us to evaluate religion from from the side if you will to see whether our religion is healthy or not now I'm a religious studies professor oh I see I run out of time and so I'll just finish by saying that as a religious studies professor um, uh, I uh, as a religious studies professor I really uh, I, I admire love religion that's all I think about actually but uh, I also think that religion uh, needs to be subjected to critical scrutiny so that we can overcome any bad habits that a religion may have instilled in us.